Hi guys, Tom from Art of Smart here, and today I'm going to run through what you need to do to succeed in the LAT. So before I begin, I want to make a pretty important note. So UNSW law doesn't actually provide any marking guidelines for the LAT. It doesn't say what specific strategies you need to follow, and it generally just doesn't give much advice. So everything I say here is going to be partly conjecture, and that's unavoidable. But what I've done is I've talked to some of my other friends who did fairly well in the LAT, and what we've done is we figured out what we all had in common in our responses, and that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today. So in general, the LAT is designed to assess a candidate's ability to generate their own ideas and express themselves through writing. Now that's actually a quote from their website, and we'll put a link in the description below. But basically the focus is on, firstly, generating your own ideas, i.e. creativity, and secondly, expressing yourself through writing. So you may be thinking, well, obviously expression is important to law, but what does creativity have to do with law school or being a lawyer? And to be honest with you, the answer from my experience is basically sure. So the test is actually very different for what you're gonna be doing in law school, and it's really not a very good reflection of your ability or your aptitude as a lawyer, but that's a story for another time. For your purposes, you're still going to have to do the LAT and we're going to have to focus on those things today. So let's get right into it. The LAT is a two hour written exam divided into two parts worth 50% each, both taking about an hour. So in the first part, it's a critical analysis of an opinion piece or an article where you're assessing its critical strength, uh, its persuasiveness and generally how good of an argument it provides. So critical analysis mainly consists of two things. Firstly, assessing the validity or strength of the arguments provided. And secondly, analyzing the interests or biases that of the person making the arguments that may influence them into arguing a certain thing. So in terms of discussing the validity of the argument, that means seeing whether there's strong, logical or empirical justification provided in favor of that argument. Uh, note, empirical means things that have been observed in reality, so like expert opinions on things, uh, statistics and all of that sort. And logical arguments obviously just means good arguments based in common sense. For example, when debating the merits of legalizing cannabis, a logical argument may be that since alcohol is significantly more harmful than weed, it makes little sense from a harm reduction perspective to criminalize weed but to have alcohol permitted. However, this argument rests on the premise that weed is less harmful than alcohol. And while that may be true in reality, a lot of your audience will not necessarily agree with you. So you really do need to establish that. You can do that through various empirical means, whether you want to bring on an expert to show the damages of like lung cancer from weed versus the damages from liver cirrhosis and damage to the kidneys from alcohol, or otherwise like statistics on the amount of deaths from overdose from alcohol versus deaths from overdose from marijuana. Just anything of that sort will really boost your argument. While it may so happen that evidence in the real world does support your argument, if your audience disagrees with you, it really doesn't matter how strong the real world evidence is if you don't include it in your own argument. So this point mainly only applies to arguments where the premise is controversial, like people will disagree with you. Obviously when it's something really clear cut and objective like cocaine is more dangerous than coffee, you don't really need to provide the same level of support. So in general, a good argument consists of logical premises backed up by good evidence. I'll give you an example of an illogical premise backed up by good evidence. These are pretty easy to spot and to break down pretty quickly in your analysis. So basically here's the argument. The earth is flat, is the premise. The, if the earth was round, then the curvature would be visible when you look out on the horizon over the ocean. Uh, the evidence is, no curvature is visible when you look out over the ocean. So obviously this argument is bullshit. But it's not because the, the evidence is invalid. Like obviously you can't see the curvature of the earth over the horizon when you're out in the ocean. It's the premise that if you can't see that, that the earth must be flat, which is obviously just not true. So now here's a logical argument that isn't actually supported by evidence. These are often harder to recognize, especially when evidence in the real world is conflicted or controversial but it's good to write about them when they appear in your analysis. So the argument is that any increase in the minimum wage will increase unemployment. So the premise is that companies won't be able to afford to hire as many workers as they do currently just because each worker is more expensive. And this seems pretty logically valid, but in actual fact, there's no consensus among economists as to whether minimum wage increases unemployment as well. So in actual fact, the evidence is contradictory. Some studies, such as one done by two American economists in the 1990s, where they compared New Jersey and Pennsylvania, when New Jersey increased their minimum wage, found no actual difference in the unemployment levels of the two cities. 
Other studies have found that increases in minimum wage actually massively increase unemployment. The fact of the matter is though that these results remain contested and you can't really make like an overarching statement on the impact of something like that. So that's basically what critiquing the validity of an argument consists of. So the second part of critical analysis is assessing what biases or motivations or interests the author may have that makes them think and argue the way that they do. So for example, in regards to the recent debate regarding pill testing at DEF CON, it's in the interest of the New South Wales state government to look like they're taking a tough stance on drugs and to be zero tolerance because their anti-drug political base will support them if they do so. However, it's in the interest of the event goers and musicians and the event runners to keep the event open and introduce pill testing because it will reduce the likelihood of deaths at their festival and make more people come and make sure the festival doesn't shut down. So those two biases are going to affect how they argue and what opinions they may have and it's important to recognise this and address this in your argument. So that's just about everything in terms of critical analysis. The second thing that you get assessed on is your ability to analyse the persuasiveness of the arguments presented. Persuasiveness comes in various forms and it's often very difficult to define comprehensively, but it's also one of the most important things to analyse. Basically, it's whether or not people are likely to believe an argument. So the main things to discuss regarding persuasiveness are, one, the rhetorical techniques and tricks used to convince or manipulate the reader into believing their message. So that's things like hyperbole, rhetorical questions, fallacious argument, jokes, uh, attacks on character, just uh, everything like that. For example, consider this argument. Australia has an atrocious record on indigenous rights and welfare and locks up asylum seekers in incredibly inhumane and cruel detention centres. Therefore, Australia has no right to criticise China for its human rights abuses. So while this argument is correct in identifying that Australia has some pretty serious human rights issues, it's invalid for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's unfairly equating the severity of Australia's human rights abuses to China's, which are significantly worse. And secondly, it's saying that having human rights abuses means you're unable to comment on the human rights abuses of other countries. And now this is just counterproductive to the goal of increasing human rights worldwide because no country is free from human rights abuses and therefore no progress from international pressure could be made if we accepted that premise. So the second thing to consider is the primary mode of persuasion. That's basically asking what type of appeal the article is making. Is it an appeal to emotion, an appeal to logic, uh, an appeal to your values and beliefs? Basically, what reaction is the article trying to elicit from you? And is it effective in doing so, or why or why not? So the third thing to consider is the tone in which the article is delivered. Is it like an aggressive, vicious attack, or is it trying to frame itself as measured, polite, and nuanced? So typically, when you're scrolling on YouTube, you see some video which has a title like Ben Shapiro destroys liberals. The aim of the video is not to convince the opposition of Ben's arguments that he is correct, but it is rather appealing to those people who already agree with him. It's preaching to the choir, so to speak. He's trying to reaffirm the support of his base. On the other hand, when someone tries to present an argument as nuanced and considerate, is often because the argument is either novel, controversial, or not widely accepted, or for whatever reason, the creator of the article is trying to change people's minds and is not trying to reaffirm the support of people who already agree with them. So you're going to want to keep this in mind when you're trying to assess the persuasiveness of an article. Newspapers are always going to be pretty persuasive to their avid readers, but other people who may not read the newspaper or the article very often aren't going to be as persuaded and they might be put off by any like vicious or aggressive attacks, whereas more nuanced and considerate things might be more appealing to them. So this is the point I want to draw attention to. The LAT marking criteria draws an implicit but very important distinction between the strength of an argument and its persuasiveness in that it has critically analysed the arguments as a different bullet point to evaluate the persuasiveness of the arguments. This is because not every strong or valid argument is persuasive, and not every persuasive argument is strong or valid. Usually strong arguments are persuasive based on their own validity, but given the fact that the Republican Party in the US still thinks that climate change is a joke, apparently this just isn't always true. For an argument to be effective, it should preferably be both valid and persuasive but an argument almost never is. So the third and final thing you're assessed on is your ability to express yourself effectively and smoothly. So this is probably the most straightforward point to address and it really comes back to what I was talking about in the previous video, which you can see in the link below. You need to be clear and precise in your writing and your wording. You don't want to leave any confusion or ambiguity in your words if you can avoid it. And if you think something you're writing is confusing, you either want to reword it or just add a bit more to it so that it makes sense. In terms of structure and organisation, you basically just want to be explicit as to what you're going to be talking about in each section of your argument 
and you want your introduction to reflect the flow of your entire piece. So that means starting with an intro which has a thesis and then a quick summary of what analysis you're going to be making in each of your paragraphs and basically how you're going to be structuring it. So there are a number of ways you can do your intro, but the important thing is that you want it to mirror your paragraphs. So for example, if in your intro you're basically saying that an argument is very persuasive but not particularly strong, you might want to structure your paragraphs in such a way that you have one argument on persuasion, why it's persuasive, the second argument on why it's not particularly valid, and just a third argument or a conclusion basically reconciling those two previous paragraphs. So the same thing goes if in your intro you're talking about the piece chronologically. You basically want your paragraphs to mirror the order of that intro, i.e. you want your paragraphs to discuss the article chronologically as well. The other important thing to do is link between your paragraphs. So say you're discussing an article written by a business owner who claims to be under immense pressure from minimum wage hikes. After say doing a paragraph on persuasiveness, you could start the next paragraph with something like, while the CEO's emotive self-presentation as a victim of vicious and unpredictable business cycles is highly effective in building sympathy for his case, his arguments as to why he should be allowed to cut the salaries of his workers are constructed in logical premises of little validity. Then you could write a topic sentence on the arguments and their validity and basically continue your regular analysis from there. So basically that's all there is to section one. The only other thing I should mention is that the section actually asks a specific and explicit question as to what you meant to do. So it asks you to write an analysis of the arguments contained in the letter which evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of the arguments and assess whether the author of the letter would successfully persuade their readers. So it's actually asking you whether or not it would be successful and what you need to do is answer that. It doesn't have to be like a yes answer or a no answer, it can be like it's probably going to persuade their regular readers but not other people. It it's a, could be a maybe and it might work to some degree but whatever you answer you do need to actually answer that question. So that brings us to section two. Section two is a bit different from section one in that it tests your critical thinking skills as well, but mainly it focuses on your problem solving skills and your creative ability. What section two will get you to do is to read and consider various materials relating to something important. So it may be a question of like, should schools make maths compulsory? Should we introduce pill testing in New South Wales festivals? Should we legalize marijuana? Things like that. So what section two does is puts you in the shoes of someone important and gets you to develop an outline of your recommendations for that specific issue to present to the public, the government, or somebody like that. So since this section is testing your problem solving skills and your ability to put together a report, it gives you a lot more creative license than the previous section when it comes to how you write, what structure you have, but obviously you still want to keep your flow, that's the main thing. The section gives you a number of different sources, things like quotes, uh, graphs, opinion pieces, satirical articles, cartoons, it, like it could be anything. So basically what you need to do is synthesize the opinions and facts presented in each of those pieces to come to a solid and cohesive argument as to what you want to do. This section is really up to you and basically how you want to approach it. It gives you a lot of freedom and this is really when you, where you want to demonstrate that you are different from other people, that you're an exceptional candidate and he really wants to show that off to the markers. But here are a couple of things you're probably going to want to keep in mind when you're making your argument. So first of all, you're going to want to assess the arguments of each piece uh, as you were doing before, like assessing the persuasiveness and the validity. Obviously, you can't go to the same level of depth, but you should still see which arguments are most convincing. Uh, to take into account when you're writing your piece. So secondly, just because an argument is bad doesn't necessarily mean that people don't care about it. So say you're arguing that we should introduce computer science into all primary schools across New South Wales. Now, you might have all the facts and statistics to show that this will improve learning outcomes, but if 80% of parents are against it, you're going to need to take that into account. You can't just do something that you think is a good idea, even when everyone disagrees with you because that is not an intelligent decision. And thirdly, just because an argument isn't presented in a formal and proper manner, so it may be satirical, hyperbolic, or something like that, it doesn't necessarily mean that the argument is invalid. For example, contemporary satire produces some of the most incisive and persuasive political arguments in modern Australian politics. And it's obviously not in the format that most people would consider proper. And fourthly, once again, you're going to need to answer the question. If the, if the section asks you to provide a report and a recommendation as to what to do, you will need to provide that recommendation. It doesn't have to be like all in favour of something or all against something, it can be somewhere in the middle, but you do need to specify exactly where you stand. In conclusion, what you're going to want to do is one, answer the questions well, two, demonstrate nuance and understanding in your arguments, and three, write in a clear and well-flowing manner. So thanks for watching, I know it was a long video but we got through it. 
Good luck for your LATs. If you have any questions or comments, uh, leave them in the comments below and I'll respond to them as quickly as I can and see you later.